Hi everyone. We'll be starting in about 15 minutes. Uh, if you, it would be great if you could move in if there's an empty seat next to you, as we are expecting a lot of people. Do feel free to take the front row. Don't be shy. Thank you.
everyone. Hi, thank you so much for waiting. Thank you. Hi, hi there. Um, welcome to SG Innovate and thank you for joining us this afternoon. We're very glad to have so many people here with us today and I think we're here on a very, with a very exciting topic. Um, but first things first, if you don't know who or what SG Innovate does, uh, we are a company, we build and scale deep tech companies in Singapore and part of the work that we do includes building the deep tech ecosystem within Singapore. And that's why we also work with a lot of partners like NUSSSI for this event today. And so without further ado, um, we'll now have Prof. Oi Bing Chin, who also do a short introduction about NUS SSI before he starts his talk. Prof. Oi, please. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Bing Chin, Directors of SSI, Smart System Institute. Uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce what SSI is about. It's one of the university level research institute in NUS. Uh, so we do R&D, we draw talents, professors from different faculties. So we do not have any faculties with us, but we have faculties associated with us from other faculties and schools. We work with the industry as well, such as uh, HGI, hospitals, and companies. And we have three research centers funded by NRF. It was started to in 2007, again funded by NRF. So we work with Tsinghua, Zhejiang University, Kyo, and Southampton on various topics. Uh, we have one AI center for translations as well as incubations. This is funded by the Sucho Industry Park. Uh, it's fu fully funded by the go uh, Chinese government. So we do collaborations with our industries, provide internship for Singapore students in China, as well as provide incubation centers for, Chinese, uh, for Singapore companies who want to adventure into China who want to bring their business to China to talk to us. We have some space there for you to use. Uh, I'm not sure what's the arrangement like, but we, it'll be a rental, but in, on the other hand, we provide some other helps as well. Again, that money comes from the Chinese government. <coughs> and of course, we conduct lectures and symposiums. So we have three centers, as I said, one is on uh, data privacies, because we have lots of data, how to ensure that data is secured and safe, and yet at the same time can do computations, inference on the huge amount of data that we have. We have to protect the data because of GDPR, PDPA, and so that center is all about data privacy preserving technologies. Then we have Qt, anything about the Qt technologies, that's what they do. Uh, all the devices, the, uh, that centers collaborate with uh, Kyo universities. Then we have Next, that collaborates with uh, Southampton's as well as uh, Tsinghua University on the search engines. Either search based on keywords, based on text, uh, images, then recommendations and associated technologies. And we have three centers, three, uh, three labs, sorry, funded by various research funding agencies. That's all about SSI, and do talk to us if you want to come for a visit to take a look at what we have. We welcome companies to license technology from NUS, from SSI, and we try to make it as palatable, as usable to you as possible. So we do have engineering team that help us to bring those products or research work by professors close to what you can adopt for the industry. Now I shall move on to the main topic of today. AI and data-driven support for prevention, intervention, and cure 
in healthcare. Among the three, it's much easier to do prevention intervention. Cure is very tough. Cure is about recommendations. For example, there are some big companies who fail in cure because it's very hard to recommend like a treatment plan for cancer and all those. It's much more complex than plain go. Uh, much more complex than that. Uh, may I know how many, many of you from medical industry, from hospitals, healthcare, and from IT side? Okay, thanks. I need to know so that I can pitch uh, about at the, at the center level. So I have two of my own startup. One is Medilot, funded by, again, SGI, invested by SGI. The other one is funded by the Chinese government. Uh, we get about 20 million RMB startup grant from the Chinese government. This is a startup in Hangzhou. So the Chinese government is doing the same like Singapore. They provide startup grant to companies to bring the talents, bring the technologies. Both are in, both are in the sector of healthcare. Now we heard about Obamacare. Obamacare is a system that penalize the hospitals for claim if the patient come back within a certain period of time, say for example, one month, the subsidy will go down. And that seems to be effective because when a patients keep on coming back, it means that either the treatment is not well, is, is not uh, well executed, or the medicine is just not correct, and so on. Therefore, the patient keep on coming back. Also, it means a cost to the government. So, therefore, this strategy seems to work. In Singapore, the MOH uh, set up the Healthcare Transformation MOHD office last year uh, in 2018, headed by our ex-president NUS of uh, ex-president of NUS Tan Cho Chuan. So that is for health promotions, illness preventions, and deliverer care, try to transform the healthcare industry in Singapore. And not too long ago, the AI.SG, AI.SG has about 150 million fund in the port of, uh, for research and development. So AI.SG has this grand core, grand challenge on healthcare. So what it wants is that he wants to call uh, research teams to propose strategies, develop systems, and so on to reduce the three H. What are the three H? So we tend to have three H problem as we age: hypertension, hyperlipidemia, hyperglycemia. Uh, it's well known that all these three can be controlled by medicines, but quite often, sometimes we can't be bothered to take medicines we may end up with complications. So end up with like stroke, uh, heart failure, kidney failure, limb amputations, eye diseases. These are the five complex, uh, uh, complex problems caused by the three simple problems if we do not take care of it. Of course, we need to have drugs compliance. We need to have uh, drugs optimizations in order to make sure that we uh, prescribe the right medicines to the right patients and so on, but if not, then we lead to more complex problems. So this is a 3H problem, and uh, ourselves, SGH, led by Marcus Ong, Dr. Marcus Ong, and NUHS, led by Dr. Nguyen, who will be here later on. So we got two grants, one for SGH side, one for NUH side, both work with a school competing myself and my colleagues. So what we need to do is for this 3H, we are expected to reduce the 3H by 20% in five years. So that will be measured and we pick Queenstown, for example, that, that we try to reduce that 3H problem by 20% in five years. And of course, in this 3H problems, we can start from the phases, from the phase of preventions. So we have chatbot, AI screening to try to effect lifestyle changes and so on, encourage people to exercise. For example, one of the app that we have, Footlock, which has been used or been used by five hospitals is for pre-diabetics preventions. 
So to encourage people to go for lifestyle changes, to exercise more, to eat healthier food, in order to not to get any of the, this 3H problem. What if once we have the 3H, then we have plenty of uh, EH, EMR data that we can analyze using AI tools? And come to the worst, of course, they have uh, aftercare. So the government wants us to reduce 3H, basically to push down as well from uh, secondary and tertiary care to primary care. That's about cost. That's about the uh, life quality of the citizens as well. <coughs> So these are the milestones and evasions that what we are expected to, to achieve, two years and five years. So we have to reduce 3H disease in Queenstown. For example, we pick Queenstown, we work with the poly in Queenstown. Uh, Queenstown has a population of 97,000. So that will be measured, will be verified by improved uh, blood pressure control, lipid panel, blood tests, and so on. And of course, we need to see the reductions of related complications as well, and to measure the EQ, 5D, the five dimensions, uh, quality of the uh, lives and, and so on by the chatbot. And what do we want to achieve? We want to build a unified end-to-end -end system, a healthcare system with the AI element inside, a unified end-to-end -end engine to integrate all favorable data sources and provide a holistic view of medical data from where we support all sorts of medical applications. And of course, the objectives are to increase the accuracies of diagnosis, to improve preventive medicines, to optimize, uh, for example, insurance products and so on, and of course, to cut costs. Now, it's easier to talk about use of AI. You heard about how wonderful AI is, but today, when you look at even at the autonomous, autonomous driving and so on, it's not going to be reality in, say, this year or next year. It's going to take some time for the AI to improve. While AI has done well in playing games like AlphaGo and so on, but you cannot apply that strategies to human. You cannot learn by administering treatment plans, medicines to human in order to discover the best plan. You cannot try out all the possibilities to get the best possible plan. And, and each human being is different. We react differently to different medicines and so on. So it's much more complex than computer games or uh, board games. So quite often, AI is not that easy to use. And the actual implementations of machine algorithms from computer science viewpoint consists about 5% of the time. Suppose I have to code some machine learning algorithms, quite often that consists of 5%, and the rest of the time we have to do lots of other donkey work, such as data cleaning, annotation, data extractions, transformations, change it to a standard format, then integrate from different sources. That would take a long time. For example, we have to clean NUHS data, 13 years data. We use about two, uh, two years to clean that 13 years data. And we could clean only 90%, 10% in the end, we have to rely on young doctors to help to clean those data. So it's not as straightforward as what most people would think. Uh, once we have that, then we start to design model. We have to do lots of parameter tuning, training to get the model correct and before it can de even deploy. Now, in a nutshell, quite often what we care about is analytics or modeling. But before we can do that, we need to acquire the data. Given that you have all the data, you do not need to acquire the data because the data come from the data feed, from whatever sensors, uh, systems that you have, but you still have to extract, clean, and annotate. Once you do that, we have to integrate before we can actually analyze the data. And once we analyze, of course, 
we need to visualize the data. The data is meaningless, the results are meaningless to use unless I try to interpret in your context. So that's where the data scientist comes in. So overall, the whole picture here is what we call the big data and where do we apply AI? We start from data extractions, cleaning, annotations, all the way to visualizations. We do not want to be overloaded with the results, with, with the data summary and so on. We want to see some representative data set to know what's going on. And that's where we apply AI to data visualizations. And of course, the last two, phases are that of data sciences, where we try to interpret the results based on the context. You need the domain knowledge. I am a computer scientist. I know nuts about, for example, medical areas. We spent 10 years, but even then, some of the words we can't even pronounce properly, either because we are not used to it, because we hardly speak of it. So for us, it's so much harder to remember those words to acquire the domain knowledge is even much more difficult. Just like in early days, the computer scientists need, needed to work with an accountant in order to design the accounting systems. The same here today. We need to work with the medical doctors, uh, clinicians, in order to design the healthcare systems. So what are the challenges? We work with five hospitals instead of a soft a problem at a time. So we work with uh, uh, SGH, NUH, and Jurong Health, and so on. So we gather all their requirements, try to understand the common needs, common problems, then design a platform, try to solve uh, various problems that are required by them, what they think they need, rather than what we think they need. These are the challenges that we commonly face, uh, five challenges. It's very time consuming to do data extractions because of different format. Uh, it's very difficult to clean the data. Uh, we will see more of this. And then we need the medical knowledge, even to fill up the missing codes. We need to have standardized diagnosis, and there's a bias in uh, the healthcare data, then the complexities of medical features, then requires lots of data storage because we never delete the data. Just like in the old days, when you, we go to hospital, we have huge pile of papers piled up with our, the files. So the challenges, the first one is on data preprocessing. It's very time consuming to do data extraction because of different storage format, difficult and expensive to do data cleaning, missing data, duplications, we face lots of uh, duplication, we saw lots of duplications, either introduced by systems or introduced by human, different coding standards. We used to have ICD-9, then ICD-10, then ICD-11 is coming out, and some start to use SNOMAC as well. And we need medical expertise to help us to annotate and fill up the missing code and so on. Also, the data come from different format, different sources. If you just use one source to clean the data, it might lead to the wrong result. So you need to use multi-source of data in order to infer what are missing in the data. And unlike other time series, healthcare data is very difficult to handle because healthcare data is not time series. We do not go to hospitals just because we feel like it or just because there's a handsome doctor somewhere in, uh, as, uh, in the hospital and so on. We don't go there just on a regular basis. We go there when you're sick and all the tests, medicines are prescribed when we are sick. So it's not a proper time series. And you try to pipe this through the standard deep learning model such as CNN, it won't work. So therefore, we have to resolve that irregularity problem to impute the missing values of the time series and to, to uh, solve the bias problem. Uh, these are the two problems we need to solve before we can really use uh, uh, standards, deep learning models, or extend the deep learning models that we have. 
it's very complex uh, for UMLS, United Medical Library System has about 3 million concepts, 10 million terms. Uh, ICD-9 has about 17,000 concepts, ICD-10 has about 93,000 concepts, and SNOMAC has about 300,000 concepts. And before today, what we have today, we did not have type complete systems, so you can ask the doctors later on to see how do they come about with the terms. I guess it's based on memory, otherwise they have to go through their thick medical reference book in order to find the right terms. So we end up with different snippets in the discharge summary. They write mostly based on memory, could be quite close, but not exact. And that explains the complexities. And we just take one data set as an example. This is an NUH surgery data set. It has 23,000 medical features. 12,000 of them are diagnosis codes, 2,000 lab test codes, and so on. So suppose we had to design a deep learning model for this. Then it has to be very fast and very efficient in all, and also has to be accurate to be able to handle so many features. Uh, data, the medical data are multi-sources, so it comes from diagnosis, lab tests, uh, procedures, medicines taken. So when you look at a patient's profile, you can see the relationship is very complex, especially if you have reached a certain age, then you can see that the number of uh, 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 tests, number of uh, medicines that we have taken could be huge. Then that graph could be very complex. And that assists complex relations among all these terms and features. You just look at, sorry, just look at one example on DM, diabetics uh, uh, mellitus. So you can see that out of this disease, there are other associated diseases based on UMLS. So you can see that all these are so complex, even for the doctors and more so for the non-medical people. Data sets management is complicated as well. When we clean the data, we change the value, we want to track who has changed what. So the data provenance has to be very strong. We want to know who has changed what value on what day and so on. We want to track all the changes. And data sets come in different format, used by different doctors, so we need to transform to the standard format and save different format for future reuse. Data sharing, many clinicians tend to save a copy of their own data or the copy of data that they are interested in. That's where we get the data, the data leakage because they keep their own copy and they send through emails or pass to another clinician and so on. That's how we had the recent problems. So, Suppose you have a central storage, such as Git for Git data, we need to avoid data redundancies to reduce storage overhead, just to keep the delta copies of the data. Data security, definitely that is the utmost important. We need to impose a sales control to healthcare data. Now, come to the AI part. As I said, when you look around the literatures, there are plenty of work about face recognitions, speech translations, image recognitions, but there are not that many on, for example, healthcare. There are major systems that fail, and some hospital cancer, some projects because they fail to rec provide good recommendations for the treatment plans. Assisting machine learning algorithm work well for image classifications and sequence predictions, but not so well for healthcare problem. This is due to the, what we call the data bio problems. Images are not random pixel, for example. Because of that, we do not use MLP, we end up using CNN. Because we know that the pixels close to each other provide important data bio for recognitions of certain features. The same as for sequence, for speech, for text. These are not random numbers or words, are based on some latent model. So we know that all these, so long as we remember the latent state at each time point, therefore we design uh, RNN and LSTM 
based on the Litton Markov model. And of course, for healthcare, what is the data bio for the healthcare, how to find, how to formulate, and how to create algorithm model to utilize and utilize them. This is a current challenge to design good algorithms to be able to predict uh, the progressions of diseases and so on, and many people are still working on it. Now, we know about this theorem, if you know AI or new computer science, I have studied computer science about f no free lunch theorem. It means that no algorithms provide you the best solutions or best results unless you use data distributions or data pile to till it to your advantage. That is, for you to design without considering the data distributions, you are likely to get average results. And it says that we need to be able to understand the data distributions in order to design the algorithms or the models. And of course, we have lots of data. What we need now, flexible models, efficient systems, and algorithm design. And of course, we want to identify powerful priors that can help us to defeat the curse of dimensionality. And today, there are plenty of opportunities for using data distributions. And today, we are working on how to learn prior from data. This is quite close or similar to what we have on domain-specific AutoML, which means that we want to auto-generate the model, like NAS, Neural Architectural Search. Given certain parameters, we can generate the model for you of certain depths. And of course, to be able to detect concept drift. The model will not work after some time when there's a drift on the labels, on the features. So we should be able to tell when that model doesn't work. It's very important for healthcare uh, applications because if the model today can predict a person with certain disease going to reach uh, what severity, at what stage, if it doesn't work well tomorrow, how would we know? So we have designed and implemented a system called Gemini, Generalizable Medical Information Analysis and Integration Platform. Uh, we started this some 10 years ago, but Lee, we got an NRF CRP grant, and we were forced to work with a local industry to translate what we do. So we pick NUHS as our partner to work with. And what they provide us is what they need. So they want their data to fit into our Gemini. And we have to use our deep learning systems, whatever they will design, to provide feedback or warning to their assistant production systems. Uh, some examples, we, are, we have two examples here. One is on readmissions predictions. So what we do is we use historical data of the last one year to predict when a patient is being discharged, how fast? Will he come back within the month? What is the chance of him coming back within a month? And for what cost that he, the patient will come back? So this is what will pop up. And you see that this patient has 88.6 chance of readmissions. Uh, the factors are the following. So this is what the system will generate. This has been verified to some extent and been integrated into the NUHS systems. The next is disease progression. So we use CKD as an example. For CKD, we use GFR to measure the health of our kidney. So we have five stages. Stage five is about normal. Stage one, more or less, we need transplant or uh, regular dialysis. So you can see that the first graph there shows that it's stable, whereas the second graph shows that it's deteriorating over the months or the year. So again, for that, we use the data of last six months or the longitudinal patient metrics for the last six months Try to predict. This is important because we want to intervene. We want to intervene at the right time before a person collapses. So these are the three examples that I show here. 
uh, use the real data that we got from NUHS. So you can see that for the real data up to the 32 bits, then we try to predict, and then use that as a stopping point, try to predict the future, and then compare against uh, the real data points, the yellow points. So here you can see that in the first pictures, it's pretty stable, but the person is not doing well, means that it needs uh, transplant. And for the second case, is deteriorating, we need to be more aggressive in interventions and need dialysis. For the third, it's about third stage of fourth stage, then the patients need some uh, monitoring and possibly need to take some medicines and so on. So these are important for the doctors because it, it will help the doctors to alert the doctors when to call the patient in before the illness gets worse. And over the years, we built the whole software stack from what we call the end-to-end -end pipeline stack. So from crowdsourcing, crowdsource to the young doctors, to the medical officers, and data integrations, big data processing, then to do deep learning and cohort processing and so on. And for, co for the machine learning part, we develop our own Apache systems, and we have released recently the second versions, uh, versions 2.0 with the auto ML. Uh, it's free software, so you can use it. And of course, for the third versions, we're going to have validations, visualizations, and model selections, and of course, make it more explainable uh, with the local explanations as well as global explanation. One example is the nodule detections. When you have a lung image, you want to know which part that caused the cancer, and how do we classify this image as the problematic uh, image? So this is again the system we help to develop for NUH. Uh, we are, SGH will be testing it soon. So what we do, we build a sandbox around the system that we have such that the data will not be leaked out. You can design the model without seeing the full data set but you can test the model. And in a nutshell, this is what you have. So the data owners can see the data, but for AI designers, for whoever want to design the model, we cannot touch the data, cannot see the data, but you can only see the samples. So to some extent, this is the whole box that we are building. So you have data access control with a fork base. Fork base is our data storage engine to, to uh, provide data immutability, data provenance, data security, and so on. And then on top, we built uh, the Apache Singas and other systems. So in conclusion, uh, healthcare is complex, but impactful, meaningful application. That's why we choose to work on it. And we have done some work for the last 10 years, like Gemini, Food Health is an app that being used by five hospitals in Singapore. The objectives are to predict, prevent, preempt, personalize for more effective healthcare. And of course, to the doctors, clinicians, what they want to do, they want to be like uh, Tom Cruise in a minority, minority report, want to preempt, prevent a disease from happening. And this is slide I from NUHS, from Dr. Nguyen. So this is what they perceive as the healthcare AI success factors. You need all these in order to make the AI adoptions in the healthcare industry uh, successful. Thank you. Sorry I've been sick, so I talked with a bit of software. Thank you, Prof. Oi. Um, for questions, we will do that right at the end of the panel discussion. So I think keep your questions in mind. So next, we will invite Prof. Marcus Ong on stage. Thank you. Hello there. My name is Marcus. Uh, I'm actually an emergency physician by training, so I'm no computer scientist, okay? Um, and uh, I usually describe myself as uh, having five jobs, running five different teams. So I still see patients. Uh, I just came from the emergency department. You know, it's full today. Um, and then 
I also, uh, the relevant hat here is five years ago, I started a data science team for our uh, health cluster. So I now have uh, four PhDs, about seven, eight analysts, and we are working on big data problems, you know, doing all the machine learning, building apps, that kind of stuff. Uh, I also serve with Ministry of Health uh, as National EMS Medical Director. So with that hat, basically, uh, I run a department that oversees, um, you know, laws, regulations regarding ambulances, you know, engagement with the community, training, and what happens to you before uh, you, you get to the hospital during an emergency. And then the, the last uh, hat is with Duke NUS, where I'm a health services researcher and I direct the health services research uh, department. So, uh, we are here today to talk a little bit about uh, expandable AI, but before that, I think we need to talk about data, right? And of course, there's been a lot of hype uh, around, you know, that uh, data is the new oil of healthcare, you know, and that using that, we can harness that to actually come up with insights about disease, biology, about improving processes and uh, systems in the hospital, you know, developing new tools, whether that's, uh, you know, robotics or med tech, or biologics, you know, new drugs. And let's not forget that, you know, our aim is to not just save lives or reduce morbidity, but also to improve the patient experience, right? That, um, you know, they have a good quality of life. And behind that all is uh, whether that's sustainable, you know, in terms of the cost and cost effectiveness. Um, what role does data science have to play in this journey, you know? So we are all familiar with, uh, you know, sort, sort, sort of like the data analytics kind of roadmap. I think Prof, we also had touched about this, you know, moving from data, doing descriptive, predictive, prescriptive, cognitive. So this is what we are used to, isn't it? Um, but I'd like to propose that um, where I come from, you know, I'm actually more interested in this part of it, right? which is that it's great to, to use data to build models. It's great to have uh, some predictions, right? But as a physician, what I'm really interested in is impacting the patient. Does it really reach the bedside? Can I actually uh, test bed some of my solutions, scale them up, and actually deploy them and implement them, you know, so that it will improve things for, for the care of my patient? And I think uh, as a clinician, that is obviously where we want to drive this whole endeavor forward. And to do that, then we realize that it requires a partnership. You know, it's not just about throwing a bunch of data scientists in a room, you know, with, in a black box with uh, big data and then crunching out solutions. It's about, you know, the data coming together with scientists, coming together with clinicians who practice on the ground, coming together with people who are actually working on solutions, deploying technology, industry, academia, and being able to reach the patient in the end, and the patient as an active part of that collaboration, you know. So I would like to, you know, set that stage to say that when we talk about explainable AI, we need to understand the context. You know, that it is a very multidisciplinary effort, it is a partnership, and it is a journey for all of us. Oh, as usual, uh, okay, there we go. And where I come from, basically what we talk about is a learning healthcare system, you know. So we do have a great healthcare system in Singapore. I come from the third best hospital in the world. But uh, I think there's still much room for improvement, right? And what we want to do is be able to move from, you know, clinical uh, problems, look at the best evidence, look at our data, come up with solutions, workflows, you know, explore that, feed that back into a learning loop, and then this is what we call the learning healthcare system, right? So at SingHealth, I think we have just begun, you know, building that journey where we are actually trying to put in place the various pieces of the puzzle such that, you know, you can actually use data insights to feedback into the clinical process and then that goes into a loop of uh, process improvement. And we have actually adopted what we call the triple aim, which means that whatever we do is guided by four principles, right? Number one, does it mean, does it, does it lead to better health outcomes, right, for my patients at a population health level, you know, reduce mortality, reduce morbidity? Does it, is it sustainable, you know, does it, uh, is it cost effective? You know, can we do things 
you know, cheaper and with no compromise on quality. Um, can we work on the quality of life and the care for the individuals I've talked about, you know, the patient experience? And then finally, let's not forget the healthcare provider. You know, does it make life easier for my nurses? Does it make life easier for my frontline healthcare providers? You know, um, my emergency department sees four to 500 patients a day. You know, it's, it's packed. You know, sometimes I have no space to put trolleys. We have to line them up around the corridor. You know, how can using AI, using data science, using insights, improve things for everyone, right? So uh, Singapore, uh, Singaporeans like to say faster, cheaper, better, right? The advantage we have is that we are actually in the midst of a massive restructuring of healthcare in Singapore. I'm not sure whether you are aware, but we have now grouped the whole country into three regional health systems. Now, the idea of that is that it will be both vertical as well as horizontal integration of the healthcare system. So I come from the largest cluster, which is Sing Health. We cover the east and the south part of the country. Um, and the idea is that I now have a whole continuum of healthcare from primary healthcare, meaning the polyclinics, a network of GPs that are actually using the same kind of uh, data reporting template. Uh, we have four hospitals, which is uh, SGH, KK, Changi, and Sengkang. And then we have the national centers, you know, heart center, eye center, cancer center, etc. Then we have step-down care. We have already uh, Amok, uh, uh, Bright Vision Hospital. Uh, now we have Utram Community Hospital coming up, Sinkang Community Hospital. And even at the home, you know, so working with nursing homes, with nurses who visit patients at home, you know, end-of-life care. And all of these are feeding data to me, right? We have worked towards uh, basically trying to streamline all these data sources and basically construct a longitudinal patient record that will actually chart the whole patient journey through each of these steps and each of these touch points in the healthcare system. So one of the strengths that I, uh, you know, I always tell uh, out outsiders or visitors about Singapore healthcare is that we are very, very early adopters of IT. I remember 20 years ago, uh, we built our own electronic health record in the emergency department. So I was sitting down with the IT professional from India, telling him, I want this, I want this, can you build this for me? No, this is no good, this is no good, do it again, right? This was 20 years ago. I have not used pen and paper to treat a patient for 20 years until I went to America to do my uh, fellowship, you know, then I started charting and then writing records again, all right? So that is our strength. We have 20 years of historical electronic records. However, that same strength is also our weakness, right? Our weakness is that we were very early adopters of technology, which means in those days, there were no off-the-shelf, standardized kind of uh, systems, right? So each of us built our own home-built system with their own data structure, data dictionary, different engines, you know, different ontology, and they are all built in silos. They don't necessarily talk to each other. So that is a bit of a problem today when we are talking about how do we integrate all these data sources, link them, you know, and make sense of the whole patient journey. So what we have done at SingHealth over the last five years is basically uh, build a massive ETL. So today, when we are sleeping at night, my data are pulling data from all the source systems, and they're uploading that through uh, Oracle BI into uh, Enterprise Warehouse, you know, which we call eHints. So this is this part of it, you know, where we are taking all the data from the source systems and chuck it into here. And, you know, at least there is some structure to it. It's fairly clean, especially the administrative data. The challenge is, of course, doctor's notes, as Prof. Yu was trying to explain just now. You know, doctors have terrible handwriting, and their typing is not much better. Um, so, yes, you know, we are fairly good in terms of structured data. When it comes to unstructured data, there's a challenge, okay? But we have that platform that we have built. And the same process that I've described at Sing Health is actually replicated across the other two clusters to some extent, okay? Although some, you know, are at different stages of development. And that feeds into what we call the Health Data Grid at Ministry of Health. So today we have something called the National Electronic Health Record. So if you come to SGH, you've never come to my hospital before, all your records are at NUH, two clicks of the button, I can see all your records. Your last admission, your prescriptions, your CT scan, you know, uh, what was your last surgery, 
it's all there, okay? And I think that is a, a big strength for us. We've actually built this layer fairly robustly. Uh, now the question is, how do we uh, make it accessible <laughs> and make it something that can power not just operations, but research and, and development as well? So on top of this, this is where my team plays. So this is the analytics and data science layers. So because we now have substrate, we now have a workable data, we can do our machine learning, our segmentation, our models, and all that. But that's not where we want to stop. You know, the next aim is to move up to an API layer, right, to be able to actually scale up digital health kind of solutions, both to the uh, patients as well as to the healthcare providers. You know? So whether it's nudging patients in terms of their behavior, or for the healthcare provider giving you uh, some decision support, uh, I think that is where we want to go to. And around that all, you, you see secure access, right? So, you know, cyber attack and all that is a reality. And actually, the hardest part for me is this, this part here, which is governance, you know, uh, issues about data quality, about um, policies, and even regulations. I also want to talk a little bit about what is the difference between data science and analytics. So I would classify myself as uh, someone who is an enthusiast in data science, not analytics. Okay, what's the difference? Data science for me is the combination of, you know, data, you know, analy analytical methods, scientific thinking, and implementation science. You know, so it is not just about the analytics. It is not just about crunching the data. But it is, at the end of the day, about translation. Okay, and this is where my other hat as a health services researcher comes in. So, for example, my department in Duke NUS, uh, I have about 20 faculty, 200 researchers. I'm one of maybe three physicians in the faculty, right? The rest of my staff or my colleagues are health economists, sociologists, behavioral psychologists, people from industrial engineering background, computer science background, biostatistics background, modelers, you know, people who do system dynamics. And we all work together bringing in knowledge from different fields of science to solve problems in healthcare. So that is health services research. That's what I'm talking about. And so today, uh, this is the team that I, I lead in uh, Sing Health. We have what we call the Health Services Research Institute, which is a bridge between the university and the healthcare system. So at the university end of things, you know, is where my health economists, my models, my quantitative people all sit. Um, this is my Sing Health team, which is in the health system, with the data science team, the data analysts, and the people who have access to data. And then the idea is we bring them together to work on problems and try and build capacity within our health system. Okay, I cannot escape from one slide at least uh, about uh, data governance, right? So I think some of you may be uh, aware of this area, some of you may not have much exposure to it, but for me this is the biggest challenge, is what keeps me awake at night and gives me a headache, right? Because, you know, we have to deal with issues not just about data security, but data quality, right? So garbage in, garbage out, right? And uh, not only that, there's the metadata behind it, you know, the structure of your master data. Uh, we have to have, you know, basically the, the right policies, the, the right way to remediate and, and uh, resolve quality or conflict issues uh, with data. And make the best of the technology enablers. Okay, so just in case you are thinking that, you know, uh, oh, all I need to do is uh, work with the hospital, get into their data, and then I can do a lot of stuff, right? Uh, yes and no, okay? Yes and no. The opportunity is there, the potential is great, but we also have to work around some of these structures. There's something called an institutional review board. Uh, there are four letter words that we have to deal with, you know, PDPA, HBRA, you know. So nowadays when I scope people, four letter words, you know, H HBRA, you know, PDPA, right? Okay, um, I have to speed up a little bit. Who is responsible for making medical decisions? What do you all think, guys? The AI? The robot? The doctor? The hospital? Good, I like somebody said the patient. There's somebody who's missing here is the patient. So the answer is actually all of the above, right? Healthcare decisions are not made in isolation. It is a partnership between the physician and the patient, 
using the best available data and supported by the policies of the hospital. So I think that's something, again, we need to understand when we talk about explainable AI, right? So what we're trying to do is actually support that decision process, you know, that we can use data, build a model. I think the thing that we need to work on is the explainable interface, right? That we can actually help to interpret or at least give uh, enough information that will support the medical decision-making process, both for the physician as well as for the patient that's involved, right? So that when your AI comes up with a recommendation, you know, it is actually enhancing that decision-making process, not taking over the decision-making process. So I think a lot of people have this uh, misconception, right, that AI is going to take over the role of doctors, you know, I don't need to study medicine anymore, I just go to computer science uh, university, study under Prof. Ui, you know. Uh, I think I will have a job for a long time to come, right, um, because human beings are very complex, right, it's not so simple. And we will always need the person on the ground to have compassion, sympathy, and empathy with the patient, right? But can AI have a role? Absolutely, you know? So I think that is when we start to talk about black box versus explainable AI, right? So, of course, we do have what we have now, you know, black box, we put in an input, we have an output. But I think where we want to move towards, you know, is to be able to go to explainable AI, right? So not just to say, I put in the data and say, okay, this is a dog, right? But to be able to actually build the explainable AI and, and say that this is a dog because he has fur and he has claws, right? And so be able to give some context and some uh, supporting kind of uh, information behind that that explains the model. So, at the end of the day, it's all about interpreti uh, interpretability, right? We have neural networks, you know, I think we, we are moving towards explainable AI and being able to actually have that kind of uh, trade-off, okay? Now, keep in mind that, of course, it's much more efficient to just run that black box, right? But I think we have to recognize the limitations of that black box and start to see that, you know, it is worth the effort to actually invest in building these explainable models. And at the end of the day, what we're talking about is fairness, transparency, accountability, and ethics, you know, which goes back to what I was talking about, governance. Okay, so let me uh, just close off with a few examples. Again, I have to speed through this because of time. Uh, some of these are actually uh, things that uh, we are already doing in Sing Health. So, for example, over the last three years, my team has been working with the Surgical Operating Theatre to actually build uh, optimization and prediction models for the use of the operating theaters, right? So we have looked at all the way from uh, demand, cancellations, you know, build a prediction model. Now we've deployed that as a solution, you know, uh, with a dashboard as well as a uh, AI-powered kind of uh, allocation system. And we are already, you know, uh, doing a pilot with our operating theater and seen a 30% improvement in utilization, you know, and I think more to come. Uh, some of you would probably have seen in the news, you know, uh, the work from our eye center around the uh, eye imaging, and they are deploying this now in a polyclinic-based kind of eye diabetic retinopathy eye screening. So I think one of the low-hanging fruit for AI is going to be image processing, right? So again, like I said, my job is pretty safe, you know, emergency physician. The ones who should be worried are radiologists and pathologists. <laughs> Uh, Probably has also talked about readmissions prediction. This is something that already today is scaled up on a national level. So today, if a patient admits to the hospital, we actually crunch overnight, uh, you know, the risk of readmission for that patient, which means that the next morning, my team of nurse navigators actually look for the patient in the ward and start discharge planning for the high-risk patients from day one. In the past, it used to be the last day, you know, when the doctor decides you're ready for discharge. Then we start this discharge planning process. Now, from day one, we already identify, oh, does this patient have a fall risk? You know, do we need to look at their home environment? Do they have a nursing home to go to? So this is already in place. Okay, my own work is, uh, of course, in the emergency kind of field, pre-hospital, uh, hospital and community. Uh, the same process I've described for Sing Health is 
being worked out in the pre-hospital realm, right? So now I have a community-facing app, I'll talk a little bit about it, uh, which is called My Responder. We are pulling data from the 995 Operations Center. We are upgrading all our ambulances with a Samsung Galaxy Tab, you know, where it's basically uh, cloud, you know, uh, connected, and we are able to actually pull that into a database, link that with hospital outcomes. Okay, so another work we are doing, I think there's a bit of audio down here. Uh, I'll keep hey, talking as we go. So it's uh, using speech recognition and powering AI for the uh, 995 call center. Okay, so you can see the big challenges that we have. Singaporeans don't speak English. They speak Singlish, they speak Chinese, Hokkien, Indian, Malay words all thrown in together. All right, so yeah, it's great. You know, you can possibly find keywords and all that, but hell a lot of work, uh. okay? Um, about five years ago, my team built a simulation model of the ambulance system. And minister asked me last year, how many more ambulances do I need to buy? Five years' time, ten years' time. So I can actually simulate this in the real world, put in the different planning parameters, and actually give him different scenario testing. Okay, so this is again something we've already deployed and we are actually doing. This is the My Responder app. 本地每天平均发生的五到六起心脏骤停个案当中，就有一起通过 接获民众九九五电话，发现有人心脏骤停。派出了急救人员后，民房人员还会通过电话指示在场民众如何施予心肺复苏术，同时也会启动My so this system is operational for about three years now already. Uh, I have now 50,000 volunteers on the app. So please go to uh, Google Play and iPhone Store and look for My Responder and you can download it, call for help and be one of our volunteer first responders. Um, I also do have to disclose I have two startup companies. One is around cooling solution. The second is uh, uh, AI-based medical triage system. And we call this AI triage. And what we use is basically... Um, heart rate variability with a combination of patient demographics, vital signs, and powered with an AI engine behind to actually re-stratify patients, for example, with chest pain, with sepsis, uh, with uh, heart failure. And uh, we're actually now scaling this up as a clinical trial across uh, five hospitals in Singapore as well as in Asia Pacific. Um, so they're telling me to speed up, so I'm going to skip... And I think probably has also talked about our collaboration for Jarvis. So if Jarvis sounds familiar, it's Iron Man, right? You know, just a very intelligent system. And uh, this is actually sort of like a big project we're working on on diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. So uh, thank you very much. Um, this is my last slide, the uh, advertising pitch I am hiring. Uh, we have a project around virtual Singapore using 3D models. Uh, I'm looking for talented young people who can do, you know, analytics, data science and all that. So please come and talk to me. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Prof. Marcus Ong. Um, we'll now invite uh, Hani as uh, our moderator for the panel discussion as well as our speakers on stage. Thank you. Hi, uh, good evening everyone. My name is Hani. Um, I basically lead product and technology at a company called Homage. It's a, it's a Singapore-based startup that's basically providing on-demand um, health care services, home care services for the, for the seniors. Uh, it's, aging is a bit, pretty big problem in, in, in Singapore. Uh, it's going to be a big problem in, in Southeast Asia in general, and we're trying to provide kind of like the Uber model to uh, get home care accessible and, and affordable. Um, I, I don't think I need to, uh, you know, introduce Professor Owe and Professor 
Marcus, because um, and thanks obviously for for uh, the uh, the presentations. But maybe we can do a quick introduction. I, I do have to say that this is probably a very uh, interesting panel for me because I'm sitting next to my professor and my wife's professor at the same time. I was not expecting that. So yeah, maybe we can just pass the mic around and um, have a quick round of introductions. Uh, I've introduced myself already. Uh, hi, I'm Dr. Nyam. I'm the uh, Group Chief Technology Officer of uh, NUHS, and I've worked closely with both Prof. Uyir and Marcus uh, on a number of projects. Uh, happy to take some questions and interesting discussions today. Great. Uh, okay, so let's get started. I think we have about um, uh, 20 minutes maybe for, for some, some questions and then we'll open up the floor for, for questions in the audience. So I think, I think uh, we, we all got a very good idea of you know, uh, what are the big challenges of applying AI. There's a, there's a space for sure for AI in the, in the healthcare uh, uh, space, but obviously um, one of the biggest questions uh, that everyone thinks about is, is trust. How can we trust a decision made by, by essentially the AI models? Uh, so maybe we can start a little bit about uh, what's the future of AI? Which sort of um, conditions do you see uh, AI being applied in the near future, in, in, in especially in this part of the world? Um, and how can we get there? Maybe I can just frame this. I think the, to, to sort of answer your first point, which is how can we trust AI, and a lot of it surrounds some technical aspects of how we make it explainable. But from a clinical deployment point of view, we must always do the right thing, which is to ensure that we run trials to uh, determine if these tools are actually safe. In, in other words, it claims, it, it says what it does. Right. And in developing AI tools, uh, I'm sure Bing Chin and Marcus would, would share the same thoughts, which is it's largely dependent on your training data set. Mm -hmm. If your training data set is biased, skewed, uh, completely or just plain wrong, anything you train will be wrong. Right. So that's it's vitally important not to just make it explainable, but ensure that you run uh, robust clinical trials to show that um, this is safe and it is as efficacious as it says it should be. And this leads on to the next part, which is something we can discuss a bit later, which is uh, it has to meet, if you, have a, if you make a medical claim on your AI device, like, oh, I can diagnose something, or I can improve the treatment of something, then it, it kind of falls into a territory of a medical, regulated medical device. Um, we are talking about FDA, HSA kind of territory. And that is, there, there's some criteria, and I must say that at this point of time, in this juncture, um, it is still very much guidelines issued by FDA, but going forwards, these guidelines will become clearer and clearer as more and more devices come to market. And uh, I'll, I'll let my, my co-panelists talk a little bit about explainable AI, and which would help us take, contextualize this a bit more. Uh, AI models not meant to be too explainable because of the number of layers. In the past, we used to have two layers. Just look at ImageNet. Those of you from AI community or computer science, you know that in 2012, we have only about eight layers. Then it shot up to about 156 layer, layers and so on after a few years. And last year, they started to cancel the competitions because you just need to put on more layers of transformations in order to get better results. Put in more GPUs, you get faster training and so on. So once you have more layers, it's getting harder and harder to explain because too much transformations are taking place. And these transformations, although you can see, can explain in mathematics, but basically it's uh, reductions of loss functions, optimization of loss functions, but on the other hand, because of the number of layers that we have, the hidden layers, and therefore it's getting harder to explain. We can explain only when, from the first layers onward, what transformation we go through in order to derive the results. is explainable to some extent, because if I can do neuro architectural search, means that I can design a model for you. By looking at your input and your expected output means that I already know 
how to derive from input to get to your ground truth means that I should be able to explain in that sense. But when the problems become too complex, it's hard to explain. Uh, that, that, that is a big problem at the moment, and we try to solve that. So my take on this is uh, I'm pretty pragmatic you know, in my approach to things. So I think that the low-hanging fruit, you know, uh, Honey had talked about, you know, what are the low-hanging fruit, you know. Uh, I think the low-hanging fruit are actually not so much in the complex kind of medical decision-making, uh, but things like image processing, you know, looking at uh, uh, what they call pathology, electronic pathology, uh, operations research, you know, optimization of process. Um, so a lot of these are very mature technologies that are already there, that have been scaled up in different industries, just not healthcare. <laughs> and, you know, if we can just bring some of these in, already we'll have, uh, uh, I think, some gains, you know, for us in the healthcare system. Um, some people have the misconception that AI has to be better than the physician decision making. No, I don't think so. You know, if you can show that AI is just as good, you know, or not worse, then the medical decision making. Then the value proposition is, can it be faster? Can it be cheaper? Can it be more efficient? Right? So I give you an example from my colleagues in the eye center. So they've been doing the retinal, the diabetic retinal photography and processing. At the moment, now they have an army of uh, basically analyzers, people who are technicians who are trained to look at the, the eye images, grade them, score them, right? And then produce a report which they are supposed to produce within two weeks, okay? Very labor intensive, fairly expensive because of the manpower component. But now they have actually built that AI engine with that same kind of feature selection, segmentation, you know, to be able to do the same job in two hours. And, you know, with just one or two technicians to, to man the system, right? Is it more accurate than the human coders? No, it's not, right? But the performance is about equivalent, acceptable. Right? So I think that for us is a gain, and that's an argument for us that it can be scaled, it can be implemented, and we can now deploy those people who are doing this to a more value-add kind of jobs. You know? So uh, you know, I've talked about radiology, you know, radiology is another obvious area. Uh, hospital processes, you know, so uh, this morning I was just with uh, an you know, NUS team, we were looking at the, my uh, department roster, you know, so it's, uh, we actually have to have one person who has to take up at least one day every month just to pour on the doctor's request and the, the scheduling of the doctors and the nurses so that we can match with uh, the demand and supply, you know. So again, we just build the AI algorithm, you know, put in the request, match it with historical demand prediction models, and that saves one day a week for a doctor. You know, that's a quick gain for me. I think I'd just <clears throat> like to echo what Marcus has said. Uh, I think that the reason why radiology, pathology, and a lot of these operational AI is, uh, is a low-hanging fruit. Anybody want to guess why? It is because it's the least prone to interpretation. You don't have to interpret it. An image is an image, right? A chest x-ray is a chest x-ray. You don't have to interpret it. But when you start needing to interpret data, for the purposes of uh, input value, then it becomes really difficult. So a good example is free text. Free text is subjective, right? So, you know, a, a particular disease can be described in, as far as I know, about 17 average ways. Uh, on average, about 17 different ways. So the, the more interpretation you need, the harder it is to apply AI, because then it's non-standard, right? And the training becomes non-standard. So there are ways to overcome that. Um, but that means that there's additional steps. So what we are seeing today around the world is anything that is an image, anything that are real deterministic operational values or uh, say a lab test, for example, those, those things are, are easy to apply, easier to apply AI on rather than things that are subject to interpretation. Absolutely, it's a good, great point. Um, on that note, like, uh, what do you think would be the roadmap uh, for uh, AI decision making uh, to come, kind of become mainstream in these low hanging fruit areas? And what do you think would be the next steps? Um, uh, which areas do you think AI would, uh, you know, uh, tackle on after the low hanging fruits? I'll just start very quickly. And so uh, there's another aspect that we haven't described here. It is. Whilst we can train, train the machines to be as good as the human, 
or sometimes slightly better than a human. What's not so sure is how does an, uh, the human interpret yep. that decision uh, given by the AI? And the, uh, we've done some uh, studies to show that actually the, the combination of human and doctor is better than human or doctor on a blind trial, right? Um, so that's the result that we want, but we're not sure that it's true for every single AI tool that's built, which is why you need to actually run clinical trials, right, to determine whether or not when a suggestion is given by an AI tool as a decision support tool, how does the human interpret that? Do they wholeheartedly trust it? Some have some value judgments, or some totally don't use that, uh, that result. So there are some um, interesting studies around that as well. Uh, so, so that's another dimension we haven't quite studied in the area of uh, uh, human-computer interactions. So I think the other uh, potential is, you know, when we start to bring in uh, additional data sources or information that can actually help in decision making, right? So um, genomics or your, you know, your sequencing and your omics and all that are classic example, right? So the problem is that there is so much information out there that is actually impossible for a single human being to process, you know, or to, to be able to even begin to comprehend, you know, not say even to make a decision, right? So where I think the AI tools are being built to help in that assimilation, aggregation, reduction, you know, in terms of the features, to make it understandable, you know, for the clinician on the ground, you know. I, th I think then that begins to have value as a decision support, you know. So I, I think um, there's been a lot of work, for example, uh, in similar similarity type of analysis, you know, that if you have a certain type of cancer, you know, and a certain type of genomic profile, and, you know, you, you have a certain uh, demographic profile or certain response in, pre in the past to medications, that we can more or less predict how you're going to respond to treatment A versus treatment B versus treatment C, right? And then you can now actually give a probabilistic uh, decision support to both the doctor and the patients and say, if you choose option A, you know, your chance of cure is X percent, but the chance of side effect or adverse events is going to be Y. You know, are you still willing to take option A? Or would you rather choose option B, you know, where you have lower side effects, but lower chance of cure as well, you know? So I think, again, this is, uh, I would say, a, a new dimension, a new area that uh, some work is already being done. Uh, but again, uh, it will require lots of different teams and integration of information coming together. Prof. Marcus, anything to add? Uh, AI will never replace human, uh, partly because they cannot out-talk the, for example, the, the two doctors. One <laughs> uh, of the reasons I've become so quiet because I've been working with them t for too long. Uh, so they can explain much more than I can explain. And uh, uh, well, I need to listen because I need to get their input in order to implement something to help them to make decisions. So AI is improving, so we try to get as close to what humans think as possible, but at the moment is hitting a plateau to some extent unless we make a breakthrough from what we have at the moment. Just keep on increasing layers and layers of transformations. We're not going to get anything near where that can mimic human brains. That is the main problem of AI. AI is a bit like young kid. So whatever you teach the AI, it learns. You start to call a car a boat, then you will identify that car as a boat the next time it sees it. So you can argue that it regurgitated to some extent, but to some extent try to learn as well at the same time. But it will take a long time before it can really replace human. And there's definitely a long way to go. Um, I think AI, specifically in the healthcare uh, uh, industry, but. Uh, let's fast forward a little bit and you know, specifically talking about explainable AI. Is AI, uh, y you know, the decision making only, um, is it only important for the doctors and the medical professionals to really understand how it got to a decision or 
like how do you build that sort of trust in the patients as well? Uh, and is it the responsibility of uh, you know data scientists and medical professionals to also make it easily understandable for from the patient's point of view? I, I suppose from the patient's perspective, there will not be a large difference if we get AI working the right way. Let me explain what I mean because um, our both panelists will agree that we are augmenting the doctor, we're helping the doctor. In the end, the legal responsibility still lies with the doctor, yeah, to have the doctor-patient relationship, right? I mean, one Friday we may have a patient-to-computer relationship. It may already happen now, I don't know. But, uh, but as far as healthcare is concerned, I think it, it will still be a doctor-patient relationship with the AI being a, um, an augmenting agent to help us do the tasks that are either mundane or just plain impossible today things like predicting you know, uh, the future of a particular event given a whole set of variables. So uh, I don't think that relationship will change uh, in the near future. So le let me interact with the audience a little bit, right? So have you guys heard of Babylon Health? Some of you have, yes, no, okay. So let me put a simple proposition to you. So how acceptable is AI to you today? If I told you today you have, let's say, fever, cough, and cold, all right? And I tell you, don't need to go to the polyclinic, don't need to go to your company doctor, just log on online or on this app. It'll ask you your symptoms, you know, do you have a temperature, yes, no, do you have a sore throat, blah, 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 this and that, right? And then you interact with a chatbot. At the end of it, it will tell you, diagnose you, and tell you, yes, one day MC, or, you know, go to the NTUC Healthcare and get two Panadol. How many of you would use such a service? Okay, some of you, okay, some of you, yeah. How many of you, if you were the employer, the company, that you would endorse this kind of service for your employees? That means you accept the MC that the, the robot generates. Okay, some of you, right? So, so you can see it's still a minority in the room. All right? So I think there are frontiers where such technology is already being trialed out. Okay, I heard the, they are actually polling in Shenton Way, you know. They're dropping leaflets into the mailboxes, you know. No need to go and see doctor, just use our app, you know, and we'll mail to you or we'll email you your MC, you know, for $10 or $15 or whatever it is. Uh, don't say that, I say that. <laughs> okay, but uh, so I think it is not just about the technology. Uh, again, it's the context, you know. I think, you know, does it make, uh, does it make sense in the, the frame of healthcare financing? Does it make sense in the medical legal framework, you know, in terms of who assigns responsibility? Does it integrate with the bigger healthcare system, you know? Have you considered healthcare behavior, you know, people's emotional cognitive response, you know, cultural factors, you know? So all these things interact when it comes to our health, right? And unfortunately, you know, the, the AI is just one piece of the puzzle and not the whole story. Um, yeah, if you tell the people they're not interacting with a bot, but rather with a doctor, I think you would get a lot more people saying okay. So, do you hear him? So he's saying that don't tell the people that you're interacting with a bot. Tell them that you're interacting with a doctor. So wait till Straits Times found, finds out about that. <laughs> I, I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about the dark side of AI, maybe. Um, have you uh, ever had any close encounters with, with AI or aware of, um, you know, I, yeah. Sorry. Okay, so let me give you an example of the dark side of AI, right? So there's some, something that we call a self-fulfilling prophecy. Okay, and th that's something that uh, I've seen um, in my field in, in, uh, among my colleagues. So, for example, uh, in Europe, you know, they actually have this issue around what we call the end of life or, you know, decisions for end of life care, all right? So basically, when do you pull the plug on the patient? The patient is on life support, right? Patient may have some, uh, let's say, a, a bleed in the brain or, you know, some uh, uh, stroke, a massive stroke or something, right, or, or had a knock to the head and they became un unconscious, right? So when do you decide that this patient is actually brain dead, not going to survive, no chance of surviving, switch off the ventilator and let them die? Or do you keep sustaining life, right? So they have now worked on various algorithms based on the EEG, based on, you know, different uh, kind of clinical as well as prognostic factors, right, and build an AI around that, you know, and recommend whether you terminate the patient, that means they are dead, or they are alive, 
right? And then, of course, you use the data from your implementation to feed back into your prediction, right? And then that improves your prediction, so-called. And then, you know, very soon your prediction is working 100%. You know, you, you predict positively everyone who is going to die. And, you know, um, it seems that they, they, they really do die. But you see, the problem is it's a self-fulfilling prophecy because the machine is making a prediction, the doctor is switching off the ventilator, and so the more data you feed in, it's a, a self-sustaining loop, and you delude yourself to say that this is actually improving your decision-making. You know, actually, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. So there is some uh, danger or risk that if we blindly apply, you know, such technology or algorithms without thinking and without looking at the context, you know, you can be let down a dark early. So uh, again, that's a very interesting ethical consideration here, right? Um, the, the health economists will tell you, right, that the best patient you know, to have um, a disease is a dead one. Then you, you don't have to count them, right? They're, they're dead, right? So they don't, need, they don't consume healthcare resources. You don't have to worry about them staying in hospital too long or you know, how many GPs you have to employ to look after this population of ill people. Um, but just a very strange irony in that. Uh, again, I want to use that example. Um, about a year and a half ago, um, some, one of the oncologists came up to me and said, hey, you know, could we, could we have a predictive tool that tells how many days does the patient has left to live? So I thought about that, and it's like, well, that's actually very doable. It's, in fact, easy to do, right? We can take all the historical data of all the people who have a particular diagnosis and how long it took for them to actually die, right? And then we run the models. We'll learn that, right? Now, of course, you think about it, that's horrendously unethical, right? Because now you have a countdown clock for a patient, you know? <laughs> can you imagine? You, oh, you are brain dead. OK, here's your countdown clock. You've got, you know, three weeks or something like that, right? But what surprised me the most is that I, I was telling the, the oncologist, hey, you know, look, if I build this thing, right, this is going to be like a death machine, right? Can you imagine how the newspapers would, 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 would you know, publicize this, you know, NUH is death machine, right? <laughs> so, so to my surprise, right, um, my oncologist colleague told me that, hey, you know, that's not what we want this to do because it, Think about what we are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Every day we are telling patients, hmm, you've got one month to live. Do the doctors know? No. They, they just, from their experience, they know that a patient who has a particular kind of cancer or a particular kind of thing, on average, has about between one to three months to live or how many months to live. Their guess is as inaccurate as a machine's guess. Nobody, they, they, they don't know exactly. A machine can tell you exactly 33 and a half days, right? But based on previous you know, events. But I think what they are trying to tell us is that, look, in, the, in replacement to help us in, by blind reckoning, right, a number is better than nothing for us to help prognosticate the patient. So what they are trying to say is, we need the tool to help us help the patient. Uh, or rather the patient's family, and tell them that, look, based on historical predicates, the patient has a, between about a month and a bit to live. That's what they want to do. And you must not divorce the fact that it is still the human giving the news. It's not the machine giving the news. Yeah. Prof. Marcus. Uh, AI is biased, partly because it's developed, the model is designed, developed by human. So AI is never fair in that sense. Also, when you start to use feedback to retrain the model, so whatever garbage that we have, the feedback, suppose they are not a good feedback, so it end up destroy the model as well. So it can influence or inject virus into a model in that sense. It will change the weights, it will change the predictions, and therefore your inference won't be correct. Therefore, AI is not trustable in that sense. <laughs> yeah, thanks. thanks for that, Prof. Um, so we have a few, uh, we have like six or seven questions submitted by the audience. So maybe we can, can shift gears to uh, the questions. Uh, are the questions going to be shown on the screen? Anyway, I can, I can probably get started over here. Um, all right. <laughs> All right, I'm going to 
actually, I think a few of these questions have probably been touched on. So I see a few interesting questions right at the bottom. Uh, the second from last, if that's possible, I, I can just read it out. Singapore are good in problem solving, but not solutions gener generating. How can we motivate a team to generate solutions? Uh, yep, so I think I touched a little bit uh, 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 during my talk, you know. So the idea is that, you know, in order to produce solutions, right, you cannot work in isolation. It has to be teams of multidisciplinary people, both, you know, the healthcare providers, the stakeholders, you know, the, the scientists, you know, people who are interpreting or making use of the data to work together to produce the solutions. And it's not just about the technology, it's about the human factors, it's about the healthcare financing, it's about issues of, about usability and, and user experience and all that, you know. So I think if we really want to move to that st stage beyond just building models, you know, to actually implementing on the ground, you know, we actually need to think in the context of a health system, you know, and, and the patient as a human being, and actually be able to put multidisciplinary teams to work on this and look, uh, work at implementation. So, um, solutions um, are very, or, or, you know, you have to have a very good problem statement before you can have a very good solution, right? I mean, uh, just to turn that question around, we, we find a lot of people going around with technologies trying to solve multiple problems. And, and often, especially in healthcare, that doesn't quite work. So um, bank platform technologies are, of course, nice to have. But if, if, the, if the problem does not suit the, the technology, then it, I, th I think it's wasting its time, in my opinion. Prof. Mark, Marcus? Uh, we do build solutions. So when the funding agency, such as NRF, provide us the fund, for example, CRP, or MOE tier three, we are forced to some extent to work with the industry. We have to look for industry partners trying to solve their problems after we work out the fundamental research. So we have to translate to some extent. That's how we end up working at hospitals because we have to work at hospitals to prove that we can translate our research into practical use. Uh, I can probably chime in a little bit as well. I think that statement might not be true in, uh, in my industry at least. Um, so I work as a product uh, person. I work, I worked in the travel space before, FinTech, um, right before healthcare, uh, which is a very recent sort of phenomenon for me. I've always been surrounded by people uh, building solutions. Um, I, I think the right way of doing that is obviously getting the right support from, from the government, uh, you know, private institutions working closely with public institutions and also finding the right professionals. Um, I work in a home care environment. Um, literally everyone in the company is, is motivated to work because they've, they've probably seen their grandparents or, or parents go through uh, some conditions at a very young age and they've been forced into the caregiving environment for, you know, at the age of 13. And that's why they want to go and solve that problem for, for the others. <clears throat> so I think, I think um, it's a bit unfair to say Singapore does not have uh, solution generators. We can obviously do a better job at that, but yeah, um, I think there's enough examples out there to kind of prove that wrong. All right, cool. Um, moving on to the next question, maybe. All right, so this is probably an interesting one. Since ML cannot, uh, let me just select that. Yeah. Since ML cannot provide certainty in uh, terms of predictions, um, there'll be some margin of error. Um, what is the acceptable percentage error for healthcare? Maybe I can start on that. Um, I, I think the. Right now, for machine learning accuracies or error rates, uh, it's slightly arbitrary, right? So the, the best way to determine what's the appropriate sensitivity, specificity, recall, precision, uh, F1 score, whatever you want to measure it by, is to look at whether or not it can perform to the level of, say, a human. So for example, the task of interpreting an X-ray, you, you, you have a a panel of doctors who interpret actually to a certain accuracy, the machine should meet or, or just maybe slightly exceed the human capability. That, that will be the best benchmark. Because to say, okay, um, 
0.9 AUC is good enough. That's just an arbitrary number. It may not mean anything in real life. So we have projects that look at falls, for example. I have a machine that can do 0.8, but you know the, the risk of, of predicting the fall is, is much, um, the accuracy right now of pre fall predicting is much higher than that. So it's irrelevant whether it's 0.8 or 0.75. It's more important that when you have that accuracy, what's your intervention? It means if I give you a certain number, what are you going to do with that number? And how does that prevent, uh, say, a fall, for example? So that, that to me is more important. I, I absolutely agree with Dr. Niam. So one thing my professor taught me when I was learning medicine, there's no 100% in medicine. There's nothing that's 100%. Uh, the issue is what is the gold standard? What is the current level standard of practice? You know? And I think, again, I'm very pragmatic about it. Right? The issue is, is it faster? Is it cheaper? Or is it better? I mean, it may not always be better, but maybe it can be faster. Maybe it can be cheaper. And if you can make one of those arguments, I think that's an argument for adoption. Prof. Marcus. Uh, for certain areas, such as uh, what Dr. Niam has said, is uh, for X-ray, for images, those for X-ray, for example, we can hit about 97, 98 percent accuracy of image classification, whether an image has a nodule or not. But for others, they are much harder. For example, for the spine MRI, CT scan, and so on, those are much harder to detect. So it depends on what problems we are looking at. Uh, but eventually, I think we will hit quite high accuracies. For disease predictions, it's much harder. There are too many factors, too many features that we have to consider. And as the doctors mentioned too, there are so many things that depends on experience. I believe what uh, some of the doctors keep on saying, telling us that so long as we can hit about 70, 75 percent, that is about to uh, doctors with a Decision about seven to uh, five to six years of experience, then we should be happy with that result. So very often we could hit only 60 percent, and we try to raise it to 70, 75. Uh, it's much harder to hit that. And of course, for AI software solutions, it works for one data set, and for another data set, it might just go down in accuracies again. So it is it, is much harder to handle compared to other data sets. Cool. Awesome, thanks. Uh, probably have time for one more question. Um, I see an interesting one over here, maybe, yeah. So many current medications are also like black box. Uh, then why do the doctors emphasize so much on the explainability of, uh, of AI models? <laughs> so, I, I think um, that, that statement is a bit disingenuous in that it's only partially true. You know, I think the one that's really black box is TCM, <laughs> traditional kind of cures, right? Or MLM, you know, all these, uh, you know, you take the deer placenta, you help the blind to see, the lame will walk and the dead will rise, you know? Uh, we do have, obviously, a very long pharmaceutical kind of pipeline, a tradition of clinical trials, you know? And there is, uh, quite a big evidence base for most of the treatments or the medications that we use. It could get better, it could get better. I would say 20 years ago when I started medicine, evidence-based medicine is not really, uh, I would say, in practice. You know, it's what we call eminence-based medicine, you know, experience-based medicine. But today, I think the healthcare system has actually transformed and moved uh, a lot into the direction of evidence-based medicine, you know, and I think uh, it's fair to say that uh, there is scrutiny on a lot of things that we do today, you know, whether treatments work, they don't work, you know, and building that evidence basis for it, right? So the, the issue then is, you know, um, can that machine learning, that AI, add value, you know, to that process of evidence-based medicine, you know, and improve our practice? Yeah, that's great. Uh, I, I think I want to add one point, which is there's some truth in the fact that we actually, whilst we know the mechanistic action of the drugs that we give to our patients, we may not know, for example, all the side effects that a patient can have because side effects are not uh, just the medication, it's got the interaction of uh, the patient's genetics, so like, for example, their pharmacogenomics and things like their 
the, their body's ability to break down the drug, etc., plus some environmental factors. So we know, for example, some drugs are affected by the kind of foods you eat, right? So I think one of the usefulness of AI would be to be able to take the large amounts of data that we have to help us predict what some of these side effects that patients may or may not get. For that matter, whether or not they will develop an allergy to a particular drug. So this is turning that, that question on its head, really, to use AI now to help us find out some things that are unknown for the particular type of drug for a particular individual. Prof. Marcus. I'm not a clinician, so I take whatever medicine they dish out to me. <laughs> uh, being close to NUH is the problem as well, because for little illness, we try to pretend very sick to see the heart. University doctors, then we get sent to hospitals. So end up my file is very thick as well because keep on seeing the, keep on going to the hospitals. The hospital become my second home, either for meetings or for seeing the specialist. <laughs> cool. No more paper files. <laughs> awesome. I think with that, uh, we do have some more questions, but maybe we can uh, kind of mingle in the, in the networking session later. Um, I do want to thank all of you for your presentations, obviously, earlier, Dr. Wee, uh, Dr. Marcus, um, and for being part of this panel. Um, really, really um, insightful. For me, personally, also very nice to kind of sit next to my own professor and kind of get a lesson again. Uh, I hope you guys all enjoyed, um, you know, the, the, the presentations earlier and the panel, and I invite you to kind of um, yeah, mingle again and, and, and talk during the networking sessions. Thanks again. Please, uh, please join me in kind of giving a, 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 a round of applause to the panelists. Thank you. Thank you.